This is the Mile High Five podcast with Carl Jensen and Doug Cunnington. We have authentic conversations about the journey to Phi, health, happiness, and some very odd tangents. We interview Phi experts, side hustlers, people on their way to Phi, and those who have reached the other side. Join us every week, and if you want the show notes and links and all that other stuff, head over to milehighfi.com. Hey, it's Doug here, and I want to give a quick intro before I send it to the full episode. This episode was recorded live at Mr. Money Mustache headquarters in downtown Longmont, Colorado. Jordan Grummet joined us. He was doing his book launch for Taking Stock, which we'll, we'll put a link. You could check it out if you haven't already picked it up. I wasn't in the episode very much, and I, I was recording. Carl and Jordan uh, chatted for a little while, and then we took live questions from the audience. So it was pretty cool. I think there were like maybe 50, 60 people around. And occasionally we do these events at the Mr. Money Mustache HQ. So if you happen to be around Colorado, and actually in this case, people came from you know different locations around the country to uh, join up. A lot of people were local though. So that's sort of the format of what we're, we're working with. There's some background noise and it was actually a little noisy that evening, but through uh, some of the miking that we were doing, the audio is pretty solid. But if you do hear some background noise, some other just general uh, chatter, um, I appreciate your patience. You know, there's only so much we could do recording outdoors. So r- really fun event and thank Jordan for, uh, you know, joining us and hopping on the show and everything. So really appreciate that. Without further ado, let's send it over to the episode. And we, like I said, we'll put a link for taking stock so you can check it out if you want to. Thanks. Yeah. So yeah, let's get started. Um, who are you? So my name is Jordan Grummet. I go by Doc G on social media. I am a physician who got burned out in medicine and just at the right moment, I received a book from Jim Dolly, the White Coat Investor, and learned about financial independence and went down the rabbit hole, just as probably many of you have, and realized that I was deeply unhappy at work and had enough money to leave, but had no clue who I was. And so I spent the next bunch of years trying to figure that out, which included a blog, a podcast, and eventually I realized that my dying hospice patients, the one part of medicine I still loved, taught me these important lessons, and a lot of them had to do with what I was struggling with in financial independence. And so I felt like the dying had so much to say about living, about money and what it means in our lives and, and what we should and shouldn't be doing. And so I put into a book called Taking Stock, a Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life. <laughs> so just Brian. so in case anyone does not know, what does a hospice doctor do? So hospice medicine is we are the doctors who take care of people in the last six months or less of their lives. So when patients decide that they're no longer going to get active treatment, they come to us and we try to help manage their symptoms, but also try to manage the psychosocial aspects of dying. And so we try to help people come to terms with their lives and come to terms with their symptoms and live what we'd call a good death. Um, a lot of people, they say they come to hospice doctors when there's nothing left to do. And I always try to dispel that myth because we can do a lot for dying people. Um, we can be there for them. We can manage their symptoms and we can help them see that life is occurring each day around them and help them enjoy that life until there are no more days. And that's it's a really positive thing, not a negative thing. So one softball question before we really get into it. I was at the store today and they have Halloween stuff there already. Um, have you ever considered dressing up as the Grim Reaper for Halloween, or is that completely inappropriate? <laughs> it, it might be slightly inappropriate for, for what I do. Um, don't, don't go to work dressed like that, yeah, just to yeah. be clear. But, but it does, I mean, there's a, there is also a levity to dealing with our lives and dealing with the end of lives. And is, you know, sometimes it's helpful to actually bring some of that levity into the conversation because it's hard enough as it is dealing with, you know, end of life issues and dealing with disease and, um, you're still allowed to have fun, even if your family member is dying, yeah. you know, and that's, that's something we try to bring to the table too, is that, that these days can also have some real goodness in them. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to tell a little bit of a sad story and then it's going to be happy after that. So, <laughs> so, so bear with me on April 25th of 2020, my parents celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. And if anyone remembers what was going on then it was the middle of COVID. So we had all these grand plans to go out there. They had reserved this restaurant to the stratosphere in Las Vegas where they lived. And then COVID happened. So as many things went, we had a zoom call, warm, warm. 
And that Zoom call happened, happened to be the last time I would ever see my father alive. Two days after that, he had an aortic dissection. And I know we've got a bunch of doctors in the audience, but an aortic dissection, correct me if I'm wrong here, is where your aorta ruptures. And from talking to some physicians, it's a great way to die. You, you, you bleed out, you go off into the night quietly, and it's, uh, it's a pretty good way to die. But he did not die. He had his first surgery was successful. He had a second one that was successful. And he was responsive for the first couple months, and then towards the end of June, he stopped responding, uh, and I had known what was going on, and my mom called me one day, and she's like, yeah, we have to have this conversation. She's like, your dad hasn't been responsive. I talked to the doctor, and the doctor said, we need to have a conversation, and the, my mom said, well, what would you do if you were in this position? And my mom's like, well, I would dis disconnect him from life support and send him to hospice care. And this was pretty strange for me because he had been responsive like a week or two before. He was actually reacting to people in his hospital room. And then all of a sudden it went away and he was not responsive. So I'm like, this is, uh, this is pretty strange. And I had never been in this situation before. And I knew Jordan. Uh, Jordan had been a friend for a couple of years. And I don't know how we got to this point. But at one point you very kindly offered to speak to me on the phone. And it was Wednesday, July 8th, two days before they pulled him from life support. And uh, you got on the phone with Mindy and I. Wife is back there somewhere. By the way, it was Mindy. She said, oh, you know, we're having trouble with this. Okay. So. You yeah. should give your wife the credit. Yeah, I appreciate you reaching out to Jordan because I didn't think of it. I didn't really, I knew what hospice was, but I didn't think of it. So uh, we got on yet another Zoom call with Jordan and talked to him for maybe an hour, an hour in an hour and a half. And I felt, I didn't feel good because of what was going on, but I felt better about the situation. I felt at peace and I tried to think about why I felt like that. And, and surely a lot of it was Jordan's expertise and the advice he gave us. People die when, when they're ready to die. It, you're making the right choice. But the other thought I had was it was really, really good just to be able to talk to someone because death is so taboo in our culture. We, we don't talk about death, but what we actually do, I think we get to a better place and we're happy about it. And then I started thinking a little bit more later on. And what else is like that? Hint, it's money. So yeah, money is also taboo. And then we don't talk about it, but if we did, I think we'd all be in a better place, like maybe the Mr. Money Mustache headquarters right now. But we're very open about money here. I don't know uh, much about death. But anyway, what, one of the things I really appreciate about Jordan's book is that he brought those two concepts together so we can talk about them. And it actually, there's a third part I really appreciate, the identity part. But yeah, that's my sales pitch for your book. I really appreciate it that you brought death and money into the conversation and made it something that I feel we can we could talk about a little bit easier. So with that said, I'm going to read uh, three things that you have written, and then I hope to have a little discussion about them. Um, has anyone seen Jordan's, uh, what would you call that, your YouTube promotional? Yeah, my trailer video. Yeah, your trailer video. It's excellent. Google taking stock. Trailer video. Yeah, 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 yeah. trailer video on YouTube, and you'll see it. But um, So at part of this, you said, as a host and creator of an award-winning financial podcast, I've discovered that we're too obsessed with investing in stocks and bonds and not enough in our unique purpose, identity, and connections. The dying understand this intimately, and those who are lucky enough to have six months or even six weeks to spend their final, final moments on Earth feel truly alive. Um, so that brings me to my first question. Um, in, in the financial independence community, we always have these fights about What's a great withdrawal rate is? Is 4% great? Someone has a big blog about why 4% is super dangerous. Uh, people ask me this question all the time, is 4% safe? And my answer is, well, there's a, there's a small chance. I think you're pretty conservative. You might run out of money, but you definitely will run out of life. You are going to die. So I'm curious to ask you, Jordan, how do you strike the balance? Because a lot of your book is you're preaching to get out there and live. But, but how do you strike the balance between safe withdrawals and life? So, I mean, I think it's really clear, right? Almost no one, and I've sat with lots of people as they're dying, and no one has ever said to me, I wish I worked more nights and weekends. No one. I mean, literally no one. No one has said, I wish my net worth was higher. Usually what they talk about is this idea of there's these things I really wanted to do and I never got to them, right? So when we really focus on things like the safe withdrawal rate, what we're really doing is we're setting money up as this big goal, this thing that we're working towards 
And so we can define what success is and what failure is, and let's debate it and let's think about it, right? What we don't do then is we don't see it for what it truly is, is it's a tool, one of many tools. And the reason we have this tool is to live more purposeful lives, full of meaning, right? So when you start looking at it that way, you realize, well, you know, it kind of doesn't matter, right? I can put my safe withdrawal rate at 4%. You know what? If I'm falling short, I can use some of those other tools, right? I can use my time, my energy, my connections, my passions, and I can use those things to sustain me. Or I can work on that money tool. I can decide sometime down the road that isn't exactly where I want it. And the intentional trade-off of spending more time making money doing something that maybe is not the most fascinating, beautiful, wonderful thing you're doing, but realizing that's providing enough time for you to then go on and do the things that are important for you is an intentional decision. So I think when we spend all this time worrying about safe withdrawal rates or worrying about some net worth number, we're being less intentional about what that money is really meant to do. And I think we have to move off of that pathway because I think if we stay there, we then make money the central thing in our life. And it's really easy to focus on money, right? Like, it's quantifiable. Like, I can measure it. I can monitor it. Like, I know exactly where I am. But how many of you have gotten to that number and one of two things happens to you? One is you find yourself like, oh my God, I've got to that number. Now what? How about double that number? Or one and a half times that number? I know we've all done that. The other problem is sometimes you get to that number and you get petrified. And the reason you get petrified is you're afraid of losing it. Like the stock market's going to go down tomorrow and all of a sudden my net worth of a million dollars, which was my financial independence number and I'm so safe and great now, it's now only worth $950,000. So loss aversion, the worry that you're going to lose what you worked so hard to get actually scares you about doubly of what it actually, your thoughts about whether I'm going to get there or not. So it's a trap. And the trap is that we look at money as the most all-important thing, and it doesn't lead to good places. And I just think if we start using that money to look towards what's meaningful to us, and including it as one of many of our tools, I think then we're going to find that happiness is not so fleeting that it can change because the stock market changed one day. This well, always happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't it kind of silly? There, there's a million blogs that focus on money because I guess that's what people read. What if we inverted that and focused on happiness and life and then used money as a tool instead to figure that part out? I think we'd all think about things a little bit differently and maybe have different priorities. I have to say, like, money blogs have changed my life, right? One of the biggest things that happened to me is Jim Daly sent me this book. It was a money book. And it set me off on a path of where I am today. But I also think that we're really reticent to look past money because it's hard. Like it's really hard to figure out what you want to do with your life. And it's scary. And all of a sudden this idea that there are things that I want to do and I might not achieve them. And you start thinking about death and you start thinking about how life is finite. And you start thinking about the fact that you only have so much time. And that's no fun. And so it's much easier to say, ah, Let's debate the safe withdrawal rate. Or, ah, let's look at this net worth. And I don't want to belittle it because I think these things are important. Like, I, I, they have their place. I just think we have to see them for what they are and then put that in perspective. Yeah, you've, you've got a great quote in the book, and it said, money doesn't deserve the high pedestal we put it on. And I think you pretty explained that pretty well right now. But an, another quote I liked was, most of what I learned about investing has nothing to do with money. Uh, do you care to expound on that at all? Yeah, I mean, money is one investment, right? And it's an important investment. But we tend to forget that we have to invest in lots of other things. We have to invest in education. We have to invest in relationships. We invest in our children. We use financial terms when we talk about money. We talk about compounding and dividends and emergency funds. And I would urge you to start using those same words when you think about experiences and knowledge and connections. Like your connections in this world compound. Um, Pete and I were talking about today, right? Like he has connections in his community and you guys help each other. Like if someone needs something done at their house, you all come together and do it together. Like that's a form of compounding. And when we only think about the money aspect of, way, of things like compounding and dividends, like other things pay dividends, your education pays dividends, right? 
your family, all of these things, if we start using those financial words, we realize that there is not an opportunity cost only to medicine or only to money. There's an opportunity cost to experiences and knowledge and education. And so we have to take advantage of that too. Okay, I've got one more thing to say. I'm actually going to have Jordan read this because this is a uh... I was thinking about this. I went through your book to prepare for this, and I had taken a bunch of notes when I initially read it, and uh, I thought, this is probably my favorite passage from your, from, from your book, but then I started thinking about it a little bit more, and it's such a, a beautiful um, s set of words. It's probably one of, my, one of the most coolest things I've ever read, so I'd like you to read it. I don't know if I could hold myself together if I read it. So, <laughs> And you think I'll be able to hold myself together? I, I don't know. This, this is so good of them, and I'm going to ask you one follow-up question, and then... We'll let the audience ask questions. Jordan does not know what I'm about to yeah. give him right now, but I think this is um, so good. So. Great. I'm going to like mess it all up, and you're going to be like, that podcast is fake. Do you, do, you, do you need to lube your voice at all? I am a cry. Oh, am I a cry? Get out your James Earl Jones voice. All right. Let me at least see what this is. Okay. This is, uh, this is really right. good. Please pay close attention. Like my daughter, we are all just children. Bobbing and floating in the vast ocean of life, our minds turn yet we have no control over the direction of the tide. My daughter's voice pulls me back to that little bed in her quiet room so many years ago. Daddy, what does it feel like to die? I drew her in close and held her tightly. My sweet child, I'm still trying to figure out what it feels like to live. Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I really say that literally, because that's pretty movie-like. <laughs> we we've had a very similar conversation. Cool. Yeah. I like that. What what have you learned anything since then? Because this was some time ago when your daughter was younger. So I think the kind of thrust of the book that I've I've really learned myself is that if you start thinking about purpose and identity and who you want to be and what you want to do, and then you start <laughs> taking money and using that as a framework to get those things, what you end up with is this, and this feels a lot like living to me. What is this? This is community and friends and being involved in people's lives and, and helping people and feeling like we grow up with this idea that we're gonna become famous and change the world and most of us don't. And I've realized at this point in my life that I actually want to change the lives of people around me more than I actually want to do that. And it's much more possible and it's much more palpable. And I know that I could be there for anyone here or someone on the street who drops something or a homeless person who doesn't have food. Like I could be there for that person and it's much more likely than being famous or creating the biggest invention or, or, or being Oprah Winfrey, right? But I can do all those things, and at this point in my life, I'm realizing how much that matters and changes the world. And so that's what living, I think, feels like to me, where I am today. Yeah. And, you know, I'd like to say one more final thing. Uh, the book is about life and death, and it's about investing, but it's also, there's a third component to it, and it's about identity in figuring out who you are and what you're really meant to do in life. And I think everyone's going to take something different from the book, but that's what I really took. And in my case, it was kind of, uh, it made me happy because I realized after reading that, that there's these exercises in the book that you go through. And I realized that I'm, I'm so fortunate and I'm so grateful that I'm exactly where I think I should be. But if you're not or have questions about that, the book is uh, really special as far as that goes. And I, I really appreciate that. You cover a lot of territory, but that was my favorite part and I thank you for like like you said this is so good right here I'm, I'm so thankful for y'all in this community and this place and what we've done here in Longmont and Pete and everyone else my neighbors so I'm looking at Brian right there like uh, um, life is so much better when you're surrounded by good people it's uh, I think it might be the most important thing actually and I'm an introvert I don't people scare the shit out of me so <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that anymore I don't believe it girl. I don't know this is uh, I've had a couple beers so <laughs> with courage but <laughs> Okay. I want to add the same thing because, like, I read Jordan's book, like, cover to cover, and really felt the same way about how it's like the stuff he's emphasizing that we should think about is really, really, like, exactly right. And you might not think of it if you're younger and you're like, I want 
early retirement, I want some other good life attributes, like thinking about it from this perspective of like super old people and Jordan's experience, like channeling it is really nice. It gives you a shortcut on wisdom. And the other thing I was going to point out is like you were talking about the withdrawal rate and stuff. Um, so Carl and I, we hang out with, a, including ourselves, but we hang out with a lot of people who have been early retired for a long time and nobody even talks about money. Yeah, I know. Like we think it's fun to talk about you know, technology and investing or whatever you're interested in. But we never talk about, like we're open about money, but we never think about like, I wish I had more or I can't wait to earn more or I'm not sure if I have enough. It's, just, it's very much like a very, you know, nobody regrets or it's not much of a strategy once you get over that that hump of like thinking you feel retired. Yeah. It's not so much a number or a withdrawal rate. It's more like, hey, now it's time to stop thinking about money. And then you can think about life more. And of course, uh, if you're really advanced, you don't even need money to do that. You can start getting wiser about it like at any point in your life. I mean, it's the even just being here the last few days, my friend Jason and I who came here, like we've had like the cool thing of interacting with a bunch of people and you start hearing what people are actually doing with their time. And it's just, you know, amazing. And most of it may be tangential to money, but a lot of it isn't. It's just you you when you start hearing what actually interests people and the projects they're building for themselves. And, yeah. you know, the cool thing about financial independence is it gives you that freedom. I, I sometimes wish I knew to have that freedom before I got to financial independence. Um, but I, you know, I think your finances are important. We should build that path, but we should also put other things front and center. And, and by and large, this community actually does it. It's, it's wonderful. I mean, look at the people around you and ask them the kind of things they dig and you get these amazing stories of most of these People are building and doing exciting things or even changing people's lives, and it's really cool. Yeah, yeah, I think it's wonderful. I've tried to persuade friends who aren't in this community to come here or to come to some of the events we have, and they're like, oh, that sounds like the most boring <laughs> shit ever. I'm going to go somewhere and talk about money or index funds. And well, what Pete said here is exactly right. We hardly ever talk about that because money is just the tool that we use, so we don't have to talk about money. The main point of having money is so we don't have to worry about it anymore and then we can move on to what's truly important and really start living because we've eliminated that part of our life. And I feel privileged to say that I'm so thankful that many of us are in that situation and we get to live like that. But it's so good. It's it's not really about money. It's about life. Yeah. And I mean, I, 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 I say it over and over again. I really think it's true. We have to also, I think one of the things that we have to carry to our community too is that money is one tool. And I think there are a lot of people who aren't in our position, right? There are a lot of people who don't feel like they have their finances in order. There are a lot of people who are young and feel like every day is just a struggle. I have to go work at my eight to six, and this feels incomprehensible. Yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Monday through, and I think it is. <laughs> and you know, one of the things I think we can help, hopefully try to remind them is that they have these other tools. Like people in their 20s have more energy than I have. Right? They have their Saturday nights and they have time to start looking at passion, time to start looking at identity and purpose. They can start creating side hustles and things that are exciting for them that they're passionate about on the weekends. And if they happen to make money, then they might be just a step away from getting away from that eight to six. And if they don't, then at least they're doing something really meaningful in their life. And so I don't think this is only a conversation for rich people. I mean, I think this is a conversation for everybody that no matter where you are, whether you're struggling to put dinner on the table or whether you're like some of us here who really do feel financially independent, we've got to start making sure that our money is serving us instead of us serving our money. And that starts when you don't have, actually. Uh, Ooh, say that last part, the money serving us. I said we have to start helping make our money serve us instead of us serving our money. And that starts really, I think, as young people. Um, sometimes when we don't have the money. And it's really incomprehensible for one of us who has some financial security to go to someone who has no financial security and say, you're looking at this wrong. But I think it is part of the important message saying, hey, I got here and I have money and it didn't really solve the problems I thought it would solve. I wish I had thought more when I was younger about adding some of this other stuff into my life and maybe using it as a way to pivot away from that life you don't like and finding ways to use all the tools we have to start building the life we do like way before we have enough money and certainly way before we die. Like you don't want to meet a doctor like me 
and not have thought about any of this stuff. Grim Reaper. Yeah, the Grim Reaper. <laughs> but, but not so grim. Nice, yeah. smiley, help, hopefully helpful, like caring, emotive, Still cries too easily. The, the happy Reaper. Yeah. Still a Reaper. But a, but a Reaper nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think we're going to do questions for the audience. And our first one, Doug is going to start out with, and it's from a friend of ours who could not be here tonight. So Doug will come up, ask his question, and then we'll open it up to the rest of you. So what you'll do is you'll come up here, state your name, and then ask the question. My name is Doug, longtime listener, first time caller. <laughs> <laughs> this question is from Jen and Scott. What would be your one piece of advice for newly fired people as they embark on their next stage in life? So my first advice for anyone, newly fired or not, is take your finances and shelf that at least for a moment and start thinking about purpose, identity, and connections. I really believe that is the driver of all this. It's the reason why we want to become financially independent. You need to take your brain off your finances briefly to start thinking about these things. I'm not saying put it away. I'm not saying being frivolous. I'm not saying put it away for five years. I'm saying give yourself a little space and time to start thinking about what you want regardless of your finances. And then let's start bringing the finances back in. I have one quick follow-up. A friend had retired and she was talking to another mutual friend and she was like, okay, I'm retired. I'm going to do this, 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 all these side hustles like making board <laughs> games on Etsy or something like that. And my friend's like, stop, hold on a second. And he said, what would you do if whatever activity you did, you couldn't make money for the next year? How would that shape your life? And I thought that was a great thought exercise because that yeah. we're so used to wanting to make money. What happens if we take that out of the equation and force ourselves yeah. not to think about and that? I state it a little differently. My big question to you is, what would you do even if no one would pay you for it? Like what job, what thing that normally people get paid for, would you still do even if no one would pay you for it? If you can answer that question, you've got a great start for what purpose looks like in your life. Podcasting. Yes, <laughs> for me. <laughs> uh, it looks like Mark has a question. Would you like to step and up to By the way, point? I measure my self-worth by your number of questions. <laughs> so the, 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 book is, the book is bunk, so if you don't ask some questions, I'm going to feel really bad. You don't want to see him cry. Yes, so. I cry so easily. Yeah. Mark's money mindset. <laughs> I want to see what he has. All right, this is uh, Mark, and you talked about the art of subtraction in the book. So maybe first explain what that is, but also you talked about it after you reached financial independence. How might somebody that has yet to reach financial independence use the art of subtraction to get maybe closer to where they uh, want to be um, prior to reaching financial independence? So I want to use this question to talk about privilege and the art of subtraction, okay? I came to this from a place of a huge amount of privilege, right? I was blessed with parents who gave me incredible financial modeling. Like they taught me all sorts of things. I had no idea what it was, but I kind of blindly followed them because that's what my parents did. So I saved lots of money. I invested in real estate. I put my money in the stock market, all things that I had no idea what I was doing, except that they did it. So I did it. So when I got disenchanted with medicine and realized I was burning out and then got Jim Daly's book and realized I was financially independent, it's really easy for me to say, oh, let's look at your life and get rid of all those things that aren't making you happy. It's a harder thing to do that when you have no money. But let me first talk about how I did it and then how I believe people who are not in that place of privilege can still use this knowledge to make a better life. So for me, what that looked like is once I realized I was financially independent, I could have walked away from my identity as a physician totally, but I wasn't ready to. Like my father was a physician. He was 40 when he died. I was seven. I was enamored with this idea of filling his footsteps. I blame myself. I, I really did. I thought somehow cosmically, I was the cause of his death. And the way I was going to fix that was to become a doctor and do the things he couldn't, right? And so when I realized I was financially independent, I just couldn't walk away completely from medicine. Like, I couldn't walk away from that sense of identity. I couldn't walk away from that little connection I had to my father that, that died, you know, he died when I was seven. So instead of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, I realized I wasn't happy. And so I started looking at my job and deciding, how am I going to subtract out the things that caused me friction? so that this can feel better, right? So I was running an incredibly busy practice at the time. So the first thing I did is I got rid of my private practice because people were calling me on the weekends and I had to run out at Sunday at 10 a.m. when I'd rather be with my family and instead I was going seeing people in their homes and they needed to be seen. But I realized that in my life, this was something that just was causing so much friction that I wasn't feeling good about it anymore. So I got rid of that. And so I started doing nursing homework, which I'd been doing for years. And then I was 
doing hospice work, which I had just started as a consultant because I realized I liked it and people wanted to pay me to do this thing that, that I found fairly natural and easy. And after a little time, I realized, you know what, the nursing home, I'm getting calls in the middle of the night. These patients are incredibly complicated. This is hard. And eventually I decided to get rid of the nursing home work. And then I was doing hospice work, but I was doing it full time. And then I was like, I don't want to work on nights and weekends anymore. So I, I kept on progressively subtracting out the things that left friction in my life. What I was left with was acting as a consultant in hospice medicine, working 10 to 15 hours a week. And that was amazing. Like after I narrowed it down, I'm like, oh, this feels purposeful. I would do this even if someone wasn't paying me for it. This has real meaning in my life. So I knew I didn't want to get rid of that. I'm like, this part of my identity still fits, but now I've gotten rid of everything else. So I have all this other time to start pursuing those things that would start adding to my identity. So what I'm doing is I'm subtracting out everything that doesn't help with my identity and purpose, and then slowly adding in new things like blogs and podcasts and whatever it is that speaks to me, that thing that wakes me up in the middle of the night and I can't get back to sleep because I'm so excited. I start to pursue those things, right? To add them into my life. So subtract out the bad, add in the good. Eventually I was able to create a life where almost all of my time I'm doing things that feel really purposeful and important. And so I don't have a need to escape my life anymore. I have no need to say, oh, I need this weekend off. There's no such thing as weekends. I just kind of spend my days doing things that are purposeful and important to me. But again, that's a place of privilege. I came to that place after financial independence. What I like to suggest is we should start thinking about how we can come to that place much earlier. How can we use the art of subtraction when we don't have all that financial power, that superpower, that tool? And again, I come back to the argument that we have many other tools. So if we go back to that 22-year-old who is now working for the first time, they found a job that they don't particularly like, but they can't find a job that they like. They're just making enough money to survive. They're working eight to six, which used to be a nine to five, but we know all things have gotten harder. But what if that person took a little time, because they don't have that much tool of money, but they've got a lot of tool of energy, right? When you're 22, you've got tons of energy. Maybe even you got the tool of passion. You got some passion. What if you took something you were really passionate about and made it into a side hustle and you said, I'm gonna spend three hours every Saturday night doing this, right? You're using some of your other tools. And let's say you do that for six months. One of two things happens. Let's say you make a little money. Well, maybe you could turn that eight to six to a nine to five. Because now you have a little financial space in your life. So you can subtract out that job you don't like and you can add in that purposeful thing, that side hustle. What if you don't make money? You do that side hustle and it never produces something. Well, you know what? You just spent three hours every Saturday doing something that was purposeful and meaningful to you. I mean, that's the goal. Maybe you might have to try a different side hustle. Maybe you have, might have to take on a part-time job on a Saturday or Sunday doing something you may or may not like. Maybe that little thing, you don't love it, but you like it a lot more than your eight to six. Maybe you can start subtracting some things out and adding some things in. Maybe it's moving to somewhere new. Like we talk about arbitrage all the time. You might subtract out your location and add in a cheaper location so that you can spend less hours at work. There are countless possibilities, but when we look at money as the goal and we think it's the only tool, then we all of a sudden cut off all of our options, especially if we happen to be in a situation where we're just making it. And so my goal is to help teach people that even when you're just making it, maybe there are some options. And maybe if you start realizing what feels purposeful to you, you can find ways to ease some of that economic pressure. And so for people who are privileged, we have it a little easier. For people who aren't privileged, there's still some options. How can we make this practice of subtracting out bad things in our life, things that add friction, and adding in good things, and make that a habit? Because at some point, you start getting where you don't have that many bad things. And that's a fantastic place. Like, so there are always going to be things we don't want to do, right? It's life. But it's amazing what it feels like when you've gotten rid of most of the bad things. Like, I don't have work stress. I don't have stress on Sunday night. I don't wake up Monday morning depressed. Like, we should all be that way. And so the question is, how do we get there? Uh, before we move on to the next question, I have a public service announcement. <laughs> and we got to do something real quick here. I'm going to put on this stupid hat, <laughs> selfie time. <laughs> and uh, this actually, I'm taking pictures on this phone that is not mine. I found it. 
So if anyone lost a phone, <laughs> is it you? I'm sorry, it is yours. You might have some pictures Please, on there that. I want this selfie. Okay. <laughs> there might be some other pictures on there that. Uh, you might not want to show those to people. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's hold take on, one. Hold on, hold on. As Gen Z, -er, I need to help you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm old. I, I don't there understand. Okay, put up a peace sign or some kind of gang sign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is there a mustache sign? Right? <laughs> there you go. I'm glad you got your phone back. Thank you. I apologize Thank for you. the other photos. I, always lose it. I can relate. I lose keys, phones. It's, oh. Well, there's my wife who's rolling her eyes right now. <laughs> yeah. You may find some dinosaurs. <laughs> okay, next question. Brendan, step up to the microphone. Brendan, I, I, the, uh, Brendan's a kind individual. I connected with him over email some years ago, and then he came to visit us in Longmont, and that's one of the great things about Longmont. There's always so many cool, interesting people passing through town, like Jordan and Today, Brendan as well, with his wife, Candy, and his two kids. Sure, yeah, Brendan here. Uh, Jordan, thanks for the talk. You mentioned briefly not wanting to get to financial independence and realize at that point that money doesn't solve all the problems you thought it would solve. Would you talk a little bit more about that and then about steps you could take before financial independence to make sure you don't get there? So when I found out I was financially independent, I did kind of jump up and down for a moment, and then I kind of had a panic attack. Like... I realized that I was so enmeshed in this identity of being a physician, I had no idea what purpose really looked like in my life. And that was amazingly depressing. And I've seen this over and over again. I mean, I've seen the Reddit accounts. I've dealt with patients. I talk about one in the book. I'm not going to retell the whole story. But it is really easy to get enamored by this idea of money. And then you get to the place where you have it. And you're like, I don't know what I want to do with myself. And that's so common and I think it actually gives us a huge amount of distress. We need to start thinking about purpose, identity, and connections first. So the, the big question, the question that people most ask me when I'm talking about my book is, well, how do I do that? <laughs> right? How do I do that? How do I do this really hard work of figuring out who I am and what I want to be in life? So I go over it in the book and their exercises, but let me give you a few very quick thumbnail sketch ideas, right? So I think purpose is a big one. And so I think you can ask yourself some really quick questions that are very short versions. Read the book to hear the long versions. So when it comes to purpose, I think you need to imagine yourself on your deathbed, bemoaning your life and saying, I really regret that I never had the energy, courage, or time to, and then fill in the blank. And like whatever you fill in the blank with is probably germane to your sense of purpose. Another good question is, you know, what do I wake up in the middle of the night excited about and I can't go back to sleep? Like, do you pursue those things? Like, what is that cockamamie scheme or idea you had? Did you put it away because it was too crazy? Like, if you let go of societal's ideas of what you should be doing, or if you let go of this idea of, can I make money off of that? Because how many times have we really wanted to do something and we said, I can't put time in that because I won't make money at it. I know when it came to writing and public speaking and stuff that I love to do, for most of my physician career, I said, oh, I have to fit this into that little half hour, hour free I have um, because it won't make me money. That's not a profession. I need to be a, a doctor, right? That, that's making money. That's doing good things. Like, I think if you ask yourself these really basic questions, you can start getting an idea of what your purpose is. And I don't, you know, I don't expect the answers to come immediately. I think it takes time. Um, but most of us have this secret idea of something that we really want to be and we're really afraid to pursue it or talk about it. And I think that is your body speaking to you. It's your mind and your heart saying, oh, there's this thing. And I will guarantee you, because I've seen it over and over again, if you don't give some time to that, you will regret it when you get a terminal diagnosis. And I, I, I tell you this from pure experience. If you do spend some time thinking about those things, you will find yourself a lot happier in life. I, I, I really believe this. So that's part one, purpose. The other thing is, so purpose, identity, and connections. Connections really come from purpose and identity. So let's talk a little bit about identity. My favorite exercise with that is to ask yourself the question or say the statement, I am, and then fill in the blank. And do this like over and over and over again because your first answers are gonna not make sense. Like my first answer is I'm a doctor. And it's totally not how I identify now, but it's the 
It's like what I've been trained my whole life to say, right? But that's kind of my profession. It's not who I am. After that, the next kind of easy thing was, um, you know, a father, a son, a spouse, right? So familiar relationships, all stuff that's kind of important to us, but doesn't really tell what's inside you, right? It's just something about who you are and, and those people who are important in your life. After that, I jumped like to achievements, right? So I'm a Plutus Award winner for the Earn and Invest podcast. I'm really proud of that, but that's kind of like this artificial thing someone gave me. It's great, but it doesn't, doesn't tell you exactly who I am. Eventually, I came to like, I'm a public speaker, a writer, a podcaster, and all of that coalesced into this idea that I'm a communicator. But it took me a long time to get there, but I knew it fit. Because it, it just, when I started thinking of life on those terms, I started feeling comfortable. And I always wondered, like, as a doctor, I never made many doctor friends. Like, I went through all of undergraduate, four years of medical school, residency, and then I practiced, and I had, like, very few doctor friends. I hated hanging out in the doctor's lounge. When I went to parties with my wife, I would get so ashamed of telling people what I did for a living. And this was, like, a huge epiphany, like, why ever would I be ashamed of being a doctor, this like proud profession that so many people want their kids to be? And the reason why is because this identity I was wearing on my outside didn't fit the identity on my inside and that disconnect felt really uncomfortable. And so the thing about identity too is you need to be aspirational. Like not just who you are today, but like who do you wanna be? Like again, if you could let go of all of societal expectations. You could let go of all those things your parents told you and all that negative speak you had in your head. If you could just be what you truly want to be, what would it be? And that's a good way to start. And if you don't know the answer to that question, ask your family, <laughs> ask your friends. Like you'd be amazed at when you ask your friends and family, and you say, well, who do you see me as? Sometimes they come up with things you're like, yeah, I am that. And I never, <laughs> I never thought about it or, or you're really good at this. Right. And, and you never consider those things. So purpose identity will naturally lead you to connections. When I realized that instead of identifying as a doctor, I started identifying as a communicator. I started going to these personal finance, like get togethers and conferences. And I met these people who were blogging and podcasting and writing. And can I tell you how strange it is to feel connected to a person after a few minutes? when you spent years surrounded by doctors and never feeling connected to any of them, like the connections will automatically come if you start figuring out your purpose and identity. And if you doubt how powerful that is, the connections I made from doing this stuff led one of my good friends, Grant Sabatier, to give me permission to write this book, which I always wanted to do, but always was too afraid and that led me to believing in myself enough to get an agent and a publisher write this book and end up here with you all and feel like I have a community, something I never had before. And so it's powerful. It's really powerful. Yeah. Why don't we do two more questions and then after that, we'll do the giveaway and we're going to be here long after this, so yep. you're all welcome to hang out. There's uh, lots of beer in the refrigerator, unless you all have drunk it already. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this crowd knows how to drink beer. I always think we bought enough, and, eat, and then and I look at this all good. Yeah. yeah, pizza, all kinds of other stuff. So um, next question. Chris. Chris, who brought me a coffee, which was very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> and Chris tortured me today by making me do a huge hike, like straight up. It was like straight up. Yeah. Okay. Compassion and fear is what I want to talk about. That's the crux of this question. And I think about myself and my biggest fear is death. And that's the voice of experience um, talking. Um, and you have been through that over and over again. And it's such a big fear of ours. We make jokes about it, right? Like the Grim Reaper joke because it's so scary we can hardly talk about it. Clearly fear is also a big component with financial independence and your journey um, in life and moving beyond finances to the next level and also taking charge of the finances. Compassion is the second piece I wanted to talk about and being a doctor who deals with people at end of life, I would imagine takes a great deal of that 
I would venture you to something of a, an expert in that area. And so the question is to give you an inroad to talk a little bit more about either fear as it relates to this journey as a barrier or compassion and what role it plays in your life and, and meaning as you think about the book and taking stock. All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll mention a little bit about both. Um, I'm going to give you a secret. So I've been around lots of people who've died. Um, dying is not nearly as fearful as most people think. We're actually really good at medications and counseling people and anti-anxiety anti medicine and nausea medicine. The grand majority, not all, the grand majority of people die fairly comfortably and peacefully. And most of you will never know that because maybe you've seen a grandparent or something, but I see it all the time. And I will tell you that generally people die quietly and comfortably. So first and foremost, the actual process of death is something I no longer fear, which I did before I came to this field. So take that for what it will. I hope that, that you know, helps. Um, people also tend to die the way they lived. So if you're worried about being afraid of the fear of death, I think you should think about fear in your life today. And the amazing thing I've learned from the dying is if you're worried and afraid of what's going on in your life today, the dying almost never regret what they failed at. They regret what they didn't have the courage to try. So I know countless stories of people who had a big audacious dream and failed. But nine times out of ten they were happy if they tried and gave it their best. But ten out of ten are unhappy if they had a big audacious dream and never went for it. So if you don't want to be afraid in death, try not to be afraid in life. And if you don't want to be afraid in life, start taking on those things you really want that scare you. Because failing is not a bad outcome. But dying with the regret that you never tried is a bad outcome. So I think that's, that's the big message on fear. On compassion, I would say that if you learn to be compassionate with yourself, you'll be much easier to be compassionate with other people. You will by far be your biggest own critic, and most of that will be wasted emotion. Um, you probably do things way better than you think you do, and believe it or not, getting 80% of the way there is usually good enough. And if you can start with self-compassion, you find yourself being compassionate towards other people much easier. And compassion feels good. So if you learn how to be compassionate to yourself, you learn how to be compassionate to other people, and that will feel, fill you with good feelings. And that's part of living kind of that peaceful life that'll help you always, and including in death. Cool. One more question. Jason. Can you speak about uh, how your dad lived his life and how that influenced you uh, thinking of Phi and um, just that journey of living your best life. So my dad died when he was 40, suddenly and unexpectedly of a brain aneurysm. And I say unexpectedly because he didn't know when. But in a sense, it wasn't unexpectedly because he had told my mom years before that he thought he was going to die young. And I sat with this for decades, right? Because I knew this even as a kid, my mom had told me this. But looking back at my dad's life, he kind of lived like he knew he was going to die young. So my dad didn't worry about money much. Like, I mean, he had life insurance. He wanted to make sure we were okay. Um, but he had like hobbies and joy and he traveled and he loved photography. And when he got finished, he was an oncologist or cancer doctor. When he finished his fellowship, instead of joining the big prestigious oncology practice that would have paid him three times what he ended up getting paid, he stayed at the university and worked at the VA because he loved the work and got paid half. And so as I think about one of, I think, the biggest important questions we all face is how do we decide whether to spend today, like you only live once, there are things that are purposeful for me, whether they're activities or even buying certain things that are very purposeful to me. How do I know if I can spend today or do I need to put that money away and allow it to compound and defer gratification for retirement? And I've really struggled with this because I think it's one of the quintessential questions we have to ask ourselves. Always, every, always. 
And I think if we had, if we knew when we were going to die, if I could say, I'm going to die in 30 years, I could plan out and, and get to zero, right, at 30 years, or, or plan out and get to having enough left for my kids to feel good about it. But we don't know. So I think the best thing we can do is use a proxy, and the proxy is what scares you most. My father was afraid that he would die young and not be able to enjoy his time or his money. So guess what? He didn't save a lot, but he lived a pretty good life. For him, that made sense. YOLO made a little more sense for him, and deferred gratification didn't. Now, he did, like I say, get life insurance policies, and he did save some money. So if he had been wrong, and he had lived, he was living a pretty good, purposeful life, and eventually he would have made it to retirement. But he probably wouldn't have wanted to retire that young because he was enjoying what he was doing from day one. And if he had just put a little money away, he would have been just fine. Now, the other side of that coin is, what if you're like me? I always figured I'd live to kind of an old life. And my biggest worry is that I'd get to an old age, run out of money, and die broke, which is, I think, a lot of people in the fire movement were afraid, right? That's why we talk about safe withdrawal rate all the time is, we're afraid of running out of money. I think if that's you, then you probably take a lot less and put it in that YOLO bucket. I still think you need to put some there. But you put a lot more in that delayed gratification bucket. So maybe you save 40 or 50% of your income and you get to financial independence and you quit your job and then you really do a lot of purpose, meaning identity stuff. But you don't do as much in the beginning because it doesn't scare you dying young. What scares you is not having enough money when you're old. If you do that, you mostly win. So if you die young and you didn't think you were going to die young and you were too busy, you know, grinding it out, you had great dreams. So you were probably pretty excited about those dreams, but you never got to live them out. And that's sad and we can't do anything about that. But if you're right, then you're going to retire early and live a pretty great purposeful life. The only other caveat is... You know, it occurs to me, and a lot of people, when I have this conversation, they bring up the Die With Zero book with Bill Perkins. One of his points, and I think is really true, is we have seasons in our life, and those seasons happen at certain times, and we can't control that. So let's say you're worried that you're going to die old and broke, so you're really grinding it out today, working long hours. You know, when you're young is also maybe when you found a, find a spouse, and if you're lucky, you're only a newlywed once. You don't want to let that time pass without giving some thought to being in the moment and and maybe YOLOing it a little bit. Or maybe you have kids, right? And you only have kids once. And yes, if you defer gratification, you might be around for their teenage years more, but you only have babies once. So you might want to slow things down a little. But ultimately, I think if we can ask our, that question, what scares you most, you can start really toggling between YOLO and deferred gratification, and it really answers that question today. I think it's a really tough question to answer. And so that's my best approximation of how to decide whether to spend or not. Okay, we have one more bonus question. What's your name? Sam. Sam, I'm sorry I stole your phone before, but no, I borrowed it. I'm okay. Glad you stole it. <laughs> Not someone else, yeah. So Sam has one final question, then we'll do our book giveaway and then we'll drink some more Great. beer. Thanks for the bonus question. Um, well my dad brought me here today and he knows that I have an ability to take advantage of social capital with which isn't always rewarded up front with um monetary compensation but can pay dividends like you've said so making those connections i know the importance of but i also know that my father's also paid for what is i think the the most formative and important space for me to figure out what is my my personality my most fulfilling self-expression while I was away in Paris and able to have that space away from being a daughter, a sister, a student. So being a, uh, a young person able to make money in my future, because um, I'm, I'm just 23, um, how can I knowing that I can use money, just not worrying about it to, to live my life freely um, and make those connections that are so important. How can I live that life um, and use that passion that I know that I have in probably an unrefined form um, to, to better my life and, and not live off my, my parents' money and ruin their financial independence. <laughs> <laughs>
And, and this is your father right here. Yeah. Yes. And, and is this so, why you brought Sam here? Do you have an ulterior motive? <laughs> yeah. so, I, I'm just kidding. She seems very good. You're, you're going to do well. I love this question, by the way. And, and I hate to say this, but I think one of the things that's my biggest wish, but probably not reality, is I love this book to actually really go to young people because I think that's when it can be used to the best. I actually, what the people who tend, that I'm getting feedback, really love the book, actually tend to be people in their late 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s because they've gotten to a financial place where they feel comfortable enough to start thinking about these things. But the thrust of the book actually is you win if you start thinking about these things now. And here's the reason why. The mistake I made, the mistake I think all of us make, is we put money first and then we start thinking about purpose, identity, and connections. If you start thinking about purpose, identity, and connections now and start getting a hold of what that means in your life, which I believe from listening to you probably have some good idea of, the next step is then to start building a financial life around that. In the book, I call, talk about something called the parable of the three brothers, and it's the three ways to think about many things, but including that are career and financial independence. There are a few different ways to go about building a financial structure that will serve your purpose, identity, and connections. And so the next step is to start figuring out which brother you are. It's the parable of the three brothers, the three different paths, in this case, to financial independence and career. And like a thumbnail sketch of this, because it, it really takes a little more time, but basically there are three good paths, right? You can put your purpose, identity, and connections mostly to the side, do the kind of traditional financial independence retire early thing, grind it out, save as much money as you can, put it in the stock market until you get to ner a net worth to a certain number, and we could go into what that number is, get to a certain number, and then once you're there, start pursuing purpose, identity, and connections. A lot of us old guys loved that way, but a lot of the younger generation doesn't. That's front-loading the sacrifice, the kind of eldest brother path. It's probably the quickest path to be done with your career, but it's not necessarily the best path, especially for young people, the middle brother's path is more passive income and side hustle. So especially if you're lucky enough to take some of what you're passionate about and start building passive income and side hustle streams out, you can then use those to make enough money to cover your monthly needs. And when you're not doing those things, you have plenty of time for purpose, identity, and connections because a big part of passive income especially is you work really hard in the beginning, but eventually you create time and space that most of it runs on its own and only needs maintenance and all that extra time and space you can really put towards purpose and identity. If you're lucky enough, your passive income stuff you also are somewhat passionate about. Last but not least, so that's the middle brother. The middle brother might take a little longer to get to the end of their career because they might not be saving as much because they're really spending what they make on their passive income every year to support themselves. So it's a little bit longer of a path to being done with your career, but you might get to this idea of financial independence where you're making enough money to cover your needs faster. Last but not least, there's the path of the youngest brother, which I call the passion play, which is immediate financial independence. If you find something that gives you a sense of joy, purpose, identity, and connections, and make a career out of that, and make enough money from day one to cover your needs, you're kind of financially independent from day one. If I had discovered hospice work at the beginning of my career, I would have been nowhere near that fine number, but I probably would have, in a sense, been financially independent because I was doing something that was so meaningful and purposeful to me I probably wouldn't have cared if it took me to 55 or 65 or 70 to retire because I would be doing what I wanted to do. So the three kind of basic archetypes or paths is front-loading the sacrifice, one, passive income or side hustles, two, or three, the passion play. If you know what really is purposeful and meaningful to you, then it's time to start looking at those paths and deciding which one could serve you. And I think that's really... Step two. So step one is figuring out your purpose, identity, and connections. Step two is figuring out which brother you are. And the last step is that last thing we just talked about is deciding what scares you most so you can decide whether to spend today or defer gratification for tomorrow. And that's what I think if every young person started there, I think that they would live a much better life than I did. And he's got a pretty good life. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for listening to the show. That was the Mile High Five podcast, and I'm Doug Cunnington, the Balder host, and Carl Jensen is the cool, sexy one. If you dig the show, please do three things for us. Number one, tell a friend, a family member, 
an enemy about the show, we really don't care who you tell. Maybe forward them a specific show that you know that they will like. It's the single most helpful thing that you can do to spread the word. It's like giving us a virtual high five and uh, actually we don't give high fives in, in person, so the virtual kind's pretty good. And more importantly, your friend or family member or even your enemy will appreciate the fact that you were thinking of them. Number two, make sure you're following or subscribed on your podcast app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, YouTube, whatever you're using, and that way you won't miss a show. And number three, please leave us a rating and review. We read them on the show occasionally, and you might hear yours out there on an upcoming episode. Quick disclaimer, this show is not financial or legal advice. I'd actually be surprised if it sounded like it. It's really just for entertainment, and that's at least what we're hoping for. But seriously, get advice from professionals. Carl and I are just two guys with microphones that sit in my basement and talk. So we'll catch y'all next week.